to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Jacobs. I am a faculty member here at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, which is the University of Minnesota School of Public Affairs. Um, and we're delighted to have this terrific conversation today. Um, if you're following us online, um, we want you to participate. We've got a bunch of questions here have already been submitted and we'll be getting to many of them. Um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, click that and uh, we'll get your questions and get them uh, part of our conversation today. Also, you'll see that there's a live transcript um, feature at the bottom of the screen. Click that if you'd like to be using uh, that as well. Welcome to what's happening at the Minnesota Legislature. Uh, we're joined today by two of the most respected and knowledgeable political reporters at the Capitol here in Minnesota. Um, first, I'd like to thank and, and welcome Brian Bax, who's been covering Minnesota politics for a quarter of a century. Yeah, <laughs> hard to believe. It is hard to believe. Uh, he's such a young guy. Um, before, uh, he's currently the um, uh, capital correspondent uh, for Minnesota Public Radio, and he's been doing that since 2016. Before that, he was at the Associated Press. It's also a pleasure to have with us Brianna Bierschbach, who has spent a decade covering Minnesota politics for a variety of publications. Uh, she started off here at the University of Minnesota in the Minnesota Daily. She's also worked for or, or submitted stories for Pioneer Press, Min Post, Associated Press, the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal, Minnesota Public Radio News, and currently is with the Star Tribune. Um, and I have to say, Brianna Bischbach is one of the most popular instructors here at the Humphrey School. She teaches a course on the governing process at the Capitol, looking around the room, I can see some of her students. The course is so popular that we've had to uh, limit enrollment because there's just so much that we can ask from a, a full-time hardworking journalist to do. So a special thanks for doing that for the school, we appreciate it. Well, let's just jump right into the, the conversation. I'm hearing a lot of very strong um, characterizations of what it's like at the Capitol. Having been there several times in the last few weeks, there is a buzz, uh, people frantically running around. Um, and there are a lot of meetings, people have been at it already since election day, in terms of putting bills in. This is unusual. Usually, it's kind of session gets going and there's a ramp up period and there's a little bit of a relaxation and smiles. And this feels like really just uh, um, an extraordinary amount of uh, action. Um, Brian Bax, how would you describe what's going on? What, what's the best way to get a, a handle on the uh, magnitude and scope of legislating at the Capitol? It's exhausting. I mean, this is unlike any session I've covered, as you mentioned, I've covered 25, my 25th session now. And it's bit the pace, the, the, the number of major policy and, and other, you know, initial budget bills that they've already pushed through. And they're continuing to push through every week, it seems like we're getting another big vote on a big bill. And I think that's interesting, because this is different than the last time that there was a one party rule at the Capitol in 20. 12 and 20 or 2013 and 2014 uh democrats uh, they feel like they missed opportunities in that in that time they they didn't uh highlight their achievements or do them in ways that the public could pay attention and if you're looking at the bills that have passed so far a lot of them are easy to encapsulate in a headline you know free school lunches uh abortion protections and I, I'm probably missing the driver's licenses for all, voting rights restoration. These are things that they want to showcase. And so they're not leaving them 
to the very end when it's lumped in with everything else, it's hard to untangle what they actually did in the session. So it's very deliberate that the, what they're doing, the way they're doing it is, is very deliberate this time. And they feel like the, the public might reward them for, for doing things and getting away from the gridlock that had encapsulated the Capitol for a while. Um, Brianna Bierschbach, um, there's a lot going on. Um, as a working journalist trying to track all this action at the Capitol, you have the bill signings by the governor, mm -hmm. you've got votes on the floor, but of course there's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get your arms around what's happening at the Capitol? It almost seems uh, impossible, it's just, it's so sprawling. Yeah, and, and that doesn't even include the many press conferences that are held every single day down the hall from our offices. I mean, I would say some days, you know, four or five right in a row. Um, I mean, it's it, you kind of have to be, you have to keep your pulse on everything. Uh, we do a lot of, I mean, I check the schedules every single night and every single morning to see what bills are being heard that we're maybe not getting press releases about. I mean, there are some big changes um, that aren't necessarily um, coming to our, are being highlighted by the majorities. And I think that that's important to know, you know, what bills maybe um, aren't getting a bill signing right away, but are going to be teed up for the budget conversation a little bit later in session, um, or even next year, you know, Democrats are going to have, um, if there is no special election or change in the Senate control for any reason, they only control that chamber by a single vote, you know, they're going to have the majority next year as well, which is a non-budgeting year, which could be mean a lot of policy issues are teed up for that time too. A lot of the legislation that's passed, and there have been 13 bills that the governor signed already, have been quite partisan. They've been party line votes, DFL on one side, Republicans on the other, um, you know, opening up driver's license regardless immigration status, uh, voting rights to formerly incarcerated, these are, and others, the, uh, some, to some extent the abortion vote. These have been very partisan votes. Have there been you know, moments of bipartisanship where you would say to tell this story only as Democrats versus Republicans would be a bit of a misstatement or an exaggeration? Sure. Some of the, some of the bills that have passed already this year, uh, the tax conformity bill that passed almost unanimously, the uh, bill related to unemployment benefits for laid off iron range miners that passed with broad support. Mm -hmm. There's the bill that passed the last week, the uh, Native American uh, child welfare bill, which which deals with foster children of, of Native American children, uh, of Native American families, they that passed with with very little opposition. There, there's been a handful, maybe six or seven bills that have had by, and even yesterday, the, the school lunch bill had four Republicans crossover. It had a couple crossover in, in the House as well. So I mean, it's not they're not entirely partisan. They're 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 largely they've been one-sided but there there have been some members that are kind of they see that it's going to happen and they want to feel like they're not on the outside looking at the, on things that could be used against them next yeah. election cycle and we did see republicans put up votes for a bonding bill mm -hmm. on the house floor i mean it unclear if that's going to go anywhere in the senate but um i mean i think that shows there's a new leadership in the minority in the house um lisa damoth um is, is now the minority leader and i think she's trying to work with democrats where she can as brian said um because if they don't they might not get any input on any bills at all so she's been very careful about uh, how much she criticizes um, the Democrats as they're moving policies ahead that they might want to make some changes on, which has been interesting to watch, I think, and a contrast from the former leadership, which might have, you know, some Republicans are of the mind that if you're in the minority, you need to sort of, you know, go on the attack and really create a, a stark contrast. And that is happening, but there are also, um, you know, some in leadership of the mind that they should try to work together too. So the Republicans, uh, just a year ago, when they were uh, had the majority in the Senate, it was also a very closely divided mm -hmm. Senate. Where was that that sense of bipartisanship then? Because we've seen over much of the last decade mm -hmm. this gridlock, um, and the DFL argues we haven't gotten anything done. It's time to move things forward, um, and now we're seeing some some evidence of bipartisanship on some bills. Why wasn't that there before? Well, there was far different philosophies at play, right? I mean, you had divided government and that was their one place to say, this is 
our vision for Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, we're going to go big on the tax cuts, whereas you might want to, at the time, I think it was a $9 billion surplus, you might want to spend most of that. Uh, we want to put a lot, a lot of it towards tax cuts. So there, so there was uh, the, the bedrock divides were much deeper mm -hmm. this time because the Democrats have set the agenda and get to set the agenda be, as, as the party in control. They're basically steering things in their direction. The Republicans are trying to figure out how they can uh, work on the margins or even help shape some of these big bills that we're going to see in the months to come. And and before, because of divided government, we would see all the agreements sort of pile up at the end. You know, I think that that's a big difference from um, what we're seeing now. Democrats are moving bills quickly. Um, Republicans have to sort of work in the process that that it exists. Um, whereas before, everything was a, a negotiation tactic or a piece that you could, you know, you wanted to hold on to as long as you could to get as much as you could out of that. This is a great example of what it means to control the agenda. Because mm -hmm. when you had divided government and legislature, it was hard for the Democrats to steer towards areas where there might have been uh, bipartisanship. Now, um, you know, the Democrats are able to do that. But we are quickly coming upon uh, some of the hard work. And maybe we could get some updates from you on some of the, the big piece of legislation uh, in no particular order. Um, there is um, bills moving on uh, paid family and medical leave. Uh, Brian, do you have a sense of where that is and what are the prospects of its passing? I think that's one that you will see pass. It's just a matter of what the final form looks like. It's a it's a huge, huge uh, priority item for uh, Minnesota Democrats. It's House House File Two and Senate File Two, meaning they they put it pretty high up the list. Uh, right now, as it stands, it would allow for 12 weeks of uh, of kind of dependent or family or long or caregiving time. Uh, that you could take off with partial pay and 12 weeks if you have your own medical uh, incident that that requires a long, long time away from work. I would imagine that that some of those weeks might get narrowed some because that's been a, a lot of the, especially the greater Minnesota members, they're getting hammered uh, when they go home by their small businesses about whether they're going to be able to uh, carry this out. And so that, that one, uh, the surplus helps there because they can seed that fund, they can they can, you know, they don't have to implement the tax right away. So they, what they want to do is they want to have a payroll tax that will eventually support the benefits, but they want to make it so when that blinks on, the benefits are also coming out. In other states, they've had to put the tax in place, and it might be years before the benefits get seen, and they're trying to avoid that type of situation. Even if they pass it this year, it's going to be a few years before that thing gets up and running, because it's a lot of build out. It's a, it's a lot of uh, infrastructure. It's going to be similar to the unemployment system. And, and so they, whether it's done in-house or they bring an outside vendor on, it's still to be determined. But that's when they want to get done now because they they want it in place in short order. And Brianna Bierschbach, um, th there's also legislation uh, moving to provide statewide renter assistance. Mm -hmm. It exists in some areas in the state, but it's not statewide. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of where that is currently? I mean, I think you're going to see something happen on that issue. Like Brian said this year, the numbers are a little bit different depending on, um, you know, the house proposal versus the governor's proposal. Um, but I, I do think, again, this is something that might end up getting worked into the budget conversation. I mean, there are standalone bills, um, you know, but that also might end up in, in, a, in a broader funding package, I think, down the line. But we're talking about quite a bit of money, you know, in the billions of dollars of some of these proposals. Um, and, and that might chip away at some things that they want to do in other areas, education spending, um, you know, tax cuts and credits. So I, I, I wonder if that number might come down from some of the top line numbers that we're seeing, but I do think something will happen. Another bill, uh, I'd be curious, both of your, your, your thoughts on this, is to legalize uh, marijuana. There was a low potency um, piece of legislation that, depending who you talk to, snuck through last session. Um, and there's some interest, including last night, in making sure there's regulation of that. But then there's you know more of a major push to legalize recreational uh, marijuana. Brian Banks, where are we on that legislation? 
it's been through pretty much every committee and might go back through some committees again. In fact, it will go back through some committees again and still might be weeks or longer away from action on either floor. That one's been interesting to watch. I mean, it's been taking shape in real time. You can actually see uh, the bill morphing as it goes along. Just mm -hmm. yesterday, the the House sponsor committed to changing the possession limits, right? The way it was initially uh, drafted, you could have eight plants, four flowering at once in your house and up to five pounds of flowered uh, cannabis. He uh, committed to changing that to 1.5 pounds. And, and, you know, it's still a lot and it's still a big shift, but you could see that they're they're trying to figure out what levers they can pull to get maybe wavering lawmakers on board. That one will probably be a bipartisan vote in the end in the, the House. It has been in the past. The Senate, who knows? Mm -hmm. We might not even see a vote in the Senate this year. I think everything they're working toward would suggest they want one, but it could be one of those that slide into another session. They wouldn't have to start over next year. Everything they do this year kind of picks up where they left off last year. So the more work they get done this year, the more they'll be able to just charge through the gate again next year. And Brianna Bearsbach, the um, the DFL margin in the House is six seats. Mm -hmm. No one would characterize that as a large margin, but they have a, more than the Senate where it's just a one seat DFL majority. What is the sticking point? What, what are the concerns of the DFLers uh, who appear to be on the fence with regards to legalizing marijuana. I think one of the questions is, is especially in some of these swing districts and really close seats in the Senate where that helped give them the majority. I think they're hearing from their local law enforcement that have concerns about how it's going to be uh, policed, you know, and, and, and just their concerns about people on the roads. Um, that those have been brought up in a lot of committees. And a couple of my colleagues did a story the other day um, checking in where folks were at on that. And, and that was one thing that most people brought up, which was um, concerns from some constituents and some businesses, but definitely law enforcement having, um, you know, come to them and talked about this. And 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 these members are are not saying what they're going to do on this. And and it's it's not just one; it's several. So um, it'll come down to their concerns being addressed um, if it'll pass or not. Um, each and every one of theirs, because all of their votes matter. So some of the votes that the DFL is taking are clearly uh, policies in which the party ran and there's large support. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial uh, bill on abortion access, uh, this was something the DFL ran on and knocked on doors about. Mm -hmm. But then you get into a set of issues where it's more complicated. Um, and legalizing uh, marijuana is one of those. Um, and some of the others are as well. And I want to ask you about gun control. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, that's an area where, um, you know, it too is complicated and it's it's raising uh, some real challenges for the DFL putting together majorities and figuring out what goes in the bill. Brian Bax, have you been following the gun control? Debate? Yeah, there, there, are, there are probably three or four DFL senators who are really uh, nervous about this one. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple Democrats who have voted against uh, gun measures in the past and are facing a lot of pressure to kind of stand back on those as well this year. The, the main gun legislation in play this year would be expanded background checks, no matter how the, you know, where you get your gun. Sometimes there's different layers of rules as if you have a gun transfer with a family member or some, some other private transaction. Uh, there is the red flag proposal. That's the one where Law enforcement could temporarily revoke your guns if you're in crisis and a, and a family member or your or another person gets a judge to say that that you shouldn't have a gun. Uh, there is the uh, ammunition. Governor Walls put that on the table this year, which would limit the amount of, of mag in your magazine that you could have for high potency uh, guns and. Gun storage. Gun storage. I mean, there's there's a bunch of things in play. That's one where I don't think we're going to necessarily see it moving on its own. It's going to be one of those that might ride along with a budget bill that has a whole bunch of other things that that members want. And, and that's kind of a tried and true tactic at the Capitol is if you don't think you have the votes straight up, you kind of try to tuck it into another bill and see if that will get it over the top. So, uh, Brianna, what, what do you think would be kind of a scaled back 
uh, gun legislation that would have more of a chance of passing? Is there some combination here that? You know, I've heard, I, I, it seems like the one that is getting the most concern is the storage piece of it. Um, so I, I, I could see that one maybe not going anywhere or um, getting pushed into another legislative session. But I think that the red flag piece is probably the one where, um, you know, I could see a, a every member potentially supporting if, um, because I think that is, you know, when you talk to to people on both sides, you know, there's concern about if someone seems to be a danger to themselves or, or to others, how do you address that situation so you don't let it get into a situation where they bring a firearm into a public place and, and use it? So I do think that there, that is probably the most likely change we could see getting through this legislature. Social security benefits uh, go out. Uh, seniors uh, rely on them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been an extraordinarily effective program. Mm -hmm. There has been talk about uh, ending or partially suspending the tax on Social Security benefits uh, for everybody or maybe just for the affluent. Brian Bax, where do you think that is? That's one of the interesting ones we're going to be watching as the budget takes shape. And, and it's another one where having total control of the legislature matters because Democrats are going to be able to, to kind of game this out a little bit more than they would if they were, you know, only had control of one chamber where in the Senate, they've got three or four members who ran on total elimination of that tax on state social, on state tax and social security benefits. They're going to be able to give their members that vote. They might fashion a tax bill that includes the total elimination and then when they go to match it up with a differing house version that might be more limited, they'll they'll try to figure out a middle ground, but the, their members will have at least some vote to give them political cover. Uh, it's an expensive proposition. It's about a billion, two billion, three for every two years of the budget and will grow as the population gets older. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a lot of pushback from folks who think maybe going the full distance isn't the way to go because it it will extend benefits to people with, you know, other earnings of 250,000 and up. And so they might try to do it, you know, set the bar a little lower, but I would imagine we're going to see something, uh, something dramatically different than is in place now that protects more of those benefits from, from the tax collectors. Yeah. I, I bet we see some kind of at least a partial um, cut of that, that tax. Um, I, Walls has proposed that. Um, but yeah, as Brian said, the, the Democrats are sort of in a tough position because they had this deal in divided government at the end of session that included a full repeal. And then when um, Democrats said Republicans walked away from that deal, they then went on the campaign trail and said, you know, we, we were there, we were ready to cut your social security taxes, but Republicans walked walked away. And now they have all the power. And so there's a lot of pressure. 10 Senate Democrats at least have put their names on bills for full repeal. So I think they're going to come in with that as their position. And it might change the negotiations, but they might get the vote that Brian so mentioned. The, the kind of the tenor and the direction of the session seems to be DFL's moving its party agenda. And with each passing week, they're getting to a spot where they've got to make choices. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be money choices. So here we're talking about, you know, how much um, of a whole will the suspending or terminating of the tax and Social Security, that's going to cost money by in terms of not getting that revenue versus uh, spending on education or other priorities. Mm -hmm. um, as you move closer to the end of session, you got to make choices and they're, they're going to put DFLers at each other's throats. I mean, there's no doubt that there's going to be disagreements. And you think about Walls' tax plan. I mean, he has a partial repeal, but he also has tax credits for families to help them pay for child care. Um, he has a new tax credit that would give families under a certain income, you know, $1,000 to $3,000 um, in their pockets. He wants his direct checks. I mean, there's those together cost somewhere close around. Um, and then a few other things, you know, four to $5 billion. So I think that when you think about that, plus education spending, plus all renters, um, aid for or for renters or people who um, are unhoused, I think that you're going to be in a situation where it's 17.5 seems small and they're going to, they're going to have to make some tough choices. And I wonder if we're going to see those 
conversations or any of those choices happen, or if it's all going to be worked out behind closed doors and suddenly they emerge with a deal. Yeah, that $17.5 billion surplus, everyone, that's a big number and it's on everyone's radar. When you break it down, $12 billion of that is one time, which means that once they spend it, it's gone. Five billion to six billion is is in there for the long the duration, which means that they can rely on it as they set the budget. So that six billion dollars is really the 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 number where the social security has to come into play. The education where they're talking about five percent more per year mm -hmm. in in per student allowances, that's going to be in there. There's child care. This session, I think, one of the things to watch is I think child care is going to be one of the, it's in for a generational change in terms of the investment that they make in both access and affordability. And it's, that's one area where there seems to be bipartisan buy-in is that, is that a lot of members from greater Minnesota in particular, they realize it's a workforce issue that, yeah. that their companies are having trouble recruiting people because there's not enough childcare capacity in their areas. And so that will be one area where I think both parties decide that, that they need to make make investments there. Mm -hmm. uh, so environment and housing. I mean, there, there's just a ton of things out there that are competing for that that small slice. Yeah. So it's very interesting, again, as we move along here, and it looks like it's a DFL juggernaut passing these major bills up to number 13. Um, and they're, they are significant. On the other hand, there is, as you're both describing, uh, some very significant disagreements and divisions. And those disagreements and divisions are most likely to become very apparent as you move into the budget, what to spend money on. And maybe child care moves to the front of the line, maybe not. Maybe there'll be you know, issues, uh, um, social security, um, some of the uh, spending um, on housing. There's some very strong advocates. Um, let me ask you about another issue which seems to be getting a lot of um, um, it's a complex issue, which there are different views among DFL, which is abortion. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the first bills passed was uh, to uh, guarantee access to abortion. But now there is more legislation, particularly two, two different uh, <clears throat> directions um, that's aiming at up to 30 different provisions. Mm -hmm. in uh, current Minnesota law to strip them out. Mm -hmm. um, some of the provisions are things like late-term abortions, which are very, very rare in Minnesota, but still um, it's a prohibition. Um, how do you see that issue playing out? Is this going to create a split among the DFL, or do you think the DFL will be able to, to pass something else that provides that broader protection of access? I think there is a split, maybe not a split, but there are some detractors to that bill already that are voicing their concerns behind the scenes. Um, you know, I think Democrats have argued that bill, which would repeal a number of provisions, some of them have been struck down by court cases, right? Both the one last summer and then some, you know, many decades ago. Um, but they do go further than that. Do they also get rid of, um, uh, Min posted a great story recently on um, how it would get rid of the, the, the report Report that the state puts out every year on um, the number of abortions, you know, um, where the residents from the state or from outside of the state, um, data that that the proponents who want to eliminate the risk report say is invasive when these questions are asked and and this isn't required um, in other kind of health care that people get, but, um, you know, myself and other reporters have been using this information to sort of talk about, to, to lay out facts about when abortions happen in the state as this conversation about, um, uh, you know, second and third trimester abortions are, are being talked about around codifying rights. So we can use that data to, um, you know, potentially dispel some misinformation about that. So it's, it's, it's interesting. I do sense that there's some, um, debate going on behind the scenes. That's another one where, it, you know, maybe it will, um, you know, get to the floor and they'll have already worked out all of those 
um, concerns and amended it in committee, or maybe it won't this session. Um, there's another bill that would also protect providers and patients trying to travel or who are traveling here, um, people who are traveling here and providers who provide them care, because in some states there's a lot more confusion about laws that might allow citizens to sue providers who allow um, people to come across state lines. So, you know, I do think we thought we were going to see votes on those already, especially in the House where Melissa Hortman promised, you know, a vote in February. We're not seeing that. So I think you know already that there are some um, concerns and some changes being made behind the scenes. Brian Baxt, um, there has been a bit of a Twitter war involving Aaron Quaid. Uh, who's been criticizing some of our colleagues uh, for not being more forceful mm -hmm. on abortion and, um, you know, stripping away mm -hmm. these prior restrictions. Her bill, which is Senate File 70, appears to be one of the most forceful in doing that. And it, um, it, it takes aim at 30 different provisions uh, that exist. Um, do you have a sense that that these disagreements are fairly intense? that Aaron Quaid is someone who's uh, bringing people together or dividing them? Well, as Brianna said, I think one of the ways you can tell whether these bills have enough caucus support to pass is if they're actually being brought to the floor. I mean, a lot of them have been through most, if not all the committees that they'll need to go through. And we haven't seen on the floor, uh, the Star Tribune had a piece this week where some of the senators said, we're having pretty knockdown, drag out fights behind closed doors as we figure out what to bring forward and what to have votes on. And I think that might be one of the, the bills that they're they're talking about. I am not as familiar with the, the Twitter battle that you talk about, but uh, the, the easiest way to tell where they think they have the votes is whether they're calling the votes. Yeah. We've got a bunch of questions here from um, folks here in the audience and folks who are online. Uh, let me get to a few of them. Um, is there any legislation moving forward that would provide free college or public two or four year uh, education? Yeah, there, there is. Uh, both chairs of the higher education committees laid out a proposal, and I, and I, I believe that there is there are limitations based on income status, mm -hmm. and 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 some might be tailored to specific demographic groups as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine that we'll see something that that at least gets the ball moving in that direction, given that uh, both chairs of the, the, the higher education committees are, are advocates for that type of proposal. Brianna, um, another question about uh, progress or likely progress in eliminating qualified immunity for police officers. Mm. Are you seeing much on that? I, I don't know of a bill. Do you? You know, they've, the the conversation has been a little more tepid this year than in the past around around kind of law enforcement issues. We're seeing that there's a hearing tonight around no knock warrants, but in the past that's been something that the Democrats have said like from day one of session we want to tackle, especially in in the in direct aftermath of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. There were a lot more conversations about those types of things. Uh, there's a bill moving around uh, uh, post traumatic stress and whether. Uh, officers with that should be entitled to ongoing workers comp and they're, they're trying to tighten that up a little bit because a lot of uh, police officers had been uh, taking mm -hmm. uh, workers comp leave and, and it's been a huge burden on cities and counties uh, but we have not seen the intensity on debates like qualified immunity that we have in the past so it's interesting here you've got a, a kind of a post george floyd issue for the dfl now they're they're in the majority either because the, they see the mood of the public as changing because of violence and other things, or because what they say could become law, we're seeing them pulling back. Uh, Brianna, there's another question here about rank choice voting. Mm -hmm. It's clearly getting a lot of attention at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. I know you've been following it. Does that become law for the state? I, I think that it, it's already clear to Senate committee and it's up in the House um, on Friday, actually. And, and the chair of that committee um, does 
support it, but I, I am hearing some concerns from Democrats who, um, you know, s- quietly are saying that they're they're worried that this is too fast. Um, this would be a, a big change to a complete overhaul of, of the way we elect candidates in the state. Um, and it's a state that already has very high turnout. It is, it's a more complicated system. Um, and under the proposal, you could have a situation where some cities are still using a plurality or the system we use now, whereas the state moves into um, a ranked choice voting system for federal, state, wide and legislative offices. So um, there's concerns. Uh, I get the sense that some people are, 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 are maybe throwing a little cold water or pumping the brakes behind the scenes on that. But, um, you know, I, I think Democrats have been the group behind this, um, has been pushing to get more Democrats in support of it kind of quietly behind the scenes for many years. Um, Speaker Melissa Hortman was a co-sponsor, the 35th sponsor on the bill in the House. Um, so there are a lot of Democrats who've pledged over the years to, to support this idea. Um, I think it won't happen um, anytime too soon. I think even the bill that's moving right now, amendment was made recently so that um, it, it had previously said, you know, around the 2026 election, we would use the statewide. That's now being tweaked to say a task force would deliver recommendations no later than 2027. So I think that if it does happen, it would be pushed to later in this decade. And, and I think there's a lot of, uh, even though more and more cities with bigger populations move to this, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington is coming on board soon, Duluth. Yeah. I think a lot of voters still don't quite understand it. And there's a lot of voter education that that the advocates are going to have to do. And the, the interesting thing about the Minnesota proposal is there would still be primaries, which is one of the things that ranked choice voting in other places has been used to avoid. Is it's that uh, there will be a couple folks in town on Friday, I think, uh, uh, Congressman Dean Phillips and his colleague from Alaska, Representative Pelota, is it Pelota? A Pelotola? Pe- yeah, Pelota. Not- and she was elected by and large because there was multiple Republicans on the ballot where she had more or less a kind of a franchise on the, the DFL, the Democratic vote in that state. So it'll be interesting to see if that to that primary and general election in ranked choice voting remains. But it, yeah. as Brianna said, some of the ranked choice voting folks were among the, the hardest door knockers. I went out with some candidates in legis- key legislative races, and they were there with their orange shirts. So they they have some allies at, at the Capitol. And I will add, though, that people are frustrated with the division we see in politics, right? And that's something that ranked choice voting supporters say that they're trying to address, right? By having to rank candidates, um, people who are extreme are penalized because they're not going to get second and third choice rankings. So um, you're seeing and hearing people getting frustrated by increasingly negative campaigns, increasingly polarized campaigns. I was trying to imagine um, a if last fall's governor race had been held with ranked choice voting, would there have been less attacks, you know, on Walls's COVID policies or less attacks on Jensen's abortion positions? If the uh, they would want their supporters to potentially rank them second, or would no one have wanted to to rank either candidate, you know, on either side first or second? So, um, you know, there's a there's a frustration that a lot of people have that folks are trying to solve. Um, it's just you know it would be a major change. This is one of those areas where I've actually done research, particularly with a colleague in political science, Joanne Miller, and um, the the proposal sold on the problems that exist, mm-hmm. but the extent to which uh, ranked choice voting solves those specific problems or creates others. One of the things we found in research we did on the Minneapolis use of ranked choice voting is that participation by voters of color, lower income, uh, appeared to be less extensive Mm -hmm. than those who were uh, voters uh, who were white and from more affluent uh, Mm -hmm. areas. And I know that's a concern in some of the communities of color. What does this mean in terms of equity and um, and and broad voter participation? So we're going to follow that. It sounds like this is a, a hot topic. Um, there are also questions about um, from our friends here who are watching what's going on in early childhood education in terms of um, uh, the uh, support and subsidies for it, uh, as well as for uh, salary increases for Childcare workers. Any update? On that? I think you'll see both. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they've already passed some legislation that uh, increased the 
uh, allowances or or like the eligibility for folks who are qualified for what's called the CCAP program, mm -hmm. and they have raised the rates. And I would imagine that they'll do that for the long for uh, a longer stretch than they did in the initial bill. Uh, and in terms of early childhood, they're also trying to attack that through the tax code and mm -hmm. uh, some of these great start tax credits where uh, families with certain incomes who spend a certain amount on on their dependent care would be able to get some of that money back through their their taxes. And so those are the types of things that I think you'll see emerge. There's there's many bills er, bill areas where the attention to the to the youngest residents are, are, are being focused on this year. And I think that's intentional. The Democrats really feel like that's one area where there's broad public buy-in around it, and they could do longer-term good. If those children get off to a good start, they might face fewer problems down the road that need fixing. Mm -hmm. um, Brianna Birschbach, we've been talking about, will the DFL get along and, and hold their majorities in the House and the Senate? How about the relationship between the legislature and the governor? Mm -hmm. If you go back to 20 to 2013-14, um, mm -hmm. um, there was a famous battle between the governor, Mark Dayton, mm -hmm. and the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Tom Bach. Bach had run for governor, lost, um, didn't really get over it. Um, and it was just very clear, a lot of resentment was there and there were battles. Um, Paul Thiessen at that point was not on the Supreme Court as he is now, but he was rather the DFL Majority Leader um, and he was focused on reelecting his majority. So you had some real divisions among those three players. Um, and do you see the relationship between the governor and the legislative leaders in the DFL um, as potentially having some pretty significant uh, splits? I, you know, I actually think it's very different than it was, you know, Walls has worked with um, Speaker Hortman now for a, a few years, they were both uh, Democrats went into the majority the same year Walls was elected. Um, so the House and Walls have been closely aligned for some time, and they've been sort of working together and became allies because Republicans controlled the Senate are very close allies. Um, and, and it's my understanding that they, you know, he ha they have a very good working relationship with Senator Kerry Dietzik, who is um, definitely seen as, as a um, someone who works with both sides is, is, is a sort of coalition builder and I and I think that it'll you know what what I understand is that they're all kind of already talking quite a bit behind the scenes about where they agree where they don't um, I sometimes wonder how much <laughs> of this is already decided in some form or another um, it, I, I get the sense that their working relationship is much better uh, than it was 10 years ago um, and that that could potentially help um, ease and, and keep some of those fights that we saw very publicly last time um, from happening. I still have my box stabber t-shirt <laughs> that was made uh, at the time when uh, when our MinPost headline was box stabbed. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, the, could the, you explain the, that for people? Sure. Tom Bach was the majority leader at the time. And Mark Dayton felt like Tom Bach stabbed him in the back. So somebody made t-shirts. And, and he said it at a press conference. He said it at a Tom Bach stabbed but me in the back. I think the personalities are a lot different this time. I mean, the, uh, the speaker and the new majority leader in the Senate, they are often in conversation. Mm -hmm. They often appear together. They're having weekly conversations, both at the legislator level and the staff level with the governor's office mm -hmm. you sometimes see coordination and messaging that you know something is coming up that that they will all be singing the same tune and i think that's a lot different i think they're 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 going to find areas where where they are deliberately going to part from him just so they can say that they're not just basically a rubber stamp you know the tax rebate mm -hmm. proposal that Brian talked about that one seems to have very lukewarm support from top DFLers and and the governor seems to know that but for some reason hasn't been out there pounding the pavement in the same way he would have if it was Republicans who were holding that up and that's interesting mm -hmm. and so I think Walls Walls is relishing these signing ceremonies and he realizes that you know, the people who are giving them these bills to sign are at the other side of the table. And so he's doing all he can to make sure that the mm -hmm. waters are calm. Yeah. But let's let's just take the um, the Waltz checks as, as he and others have referred to them. These tax cuts are uh, that he wants the rebates. He wants to send back to voters. You know, there's a political reading on that, which is the governor is anticipating elections in 
2024 and 2026. It's not a mystery what the Republicans will run on that the, the liberals have tax and spending. Um, and he's trying to protect the DFL majorities and his office from those attacks. And he thinks the, um, the, the tax rebates or cuts is part of it. And I was very intrigued by the language that he's used to describe it, which in some ways sounds quite Republican. Uh, he talks about, um, you know, wanting to give money back um, to working Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, he's aligned with Republicans on this one. They are like all, all on board with doing some sort of rebate. The rebate proposal is slightly different, but they want that money going back. It's a it's an expensive proposition. It's about three point nine billion dollars as it's constructed, uh, and that's even after he whittled it back some last year. The income threshold was much higher this year. If you make if your family making more than $150,000, you're probably not going to get one of these rebates. And, and it's hard to say they're checks right now because they're trying to figure out a way to do it where they would be able to send the money out without the federal government getting its share. So it's, it's really still in progress. But uh, the, the walls, people feel like this is a good use of one-time money mm -hmm. because they're not, they're not dedicating the state to some sort of tax drawdown that will maybe handcuff them down the road. And I will say it's, it is certainly Republicans have proposed this idea now too, but there are some very progressive Democrats, including Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who support one-time checks um, because it's seen as a strong anti-poverty measure. It's seen as a way to put hand, money immediately in the hands of people who need it and they can figure out how to, how to use it. And, and it, and when you do have one-time money, um, and in so much of it, you know, this is this could be a good way to maybe tip people, some people who are in poverty, over the edge. So maybe Representative Ilhan Omar's memo has not reached the DFL here in Minnesota. <laughs> maybe not. Um, let me ask you about the uh, Fairview Stanford Stanford merger uh, conversation. Um, the university um, has jumped into this and is using it as an opportunity to make a further request to the legislature for funding. First, what do you think the legislature will do, if anything, on the merger? And secondly, how does the use uh, budget request uh, faring at the Capitol? It's been interesting to, to see how engaged lawmakers have been around this merger and some of the hearings they've held where things have delays have been announced partly because they and Attorney General Ellison and others are, are asking questions around this. And as you mentioned, the U is didn't just uh, shake its head and say, okay, they're saying we want something out of this as well. And they might get the, the legislature to pony up more money to, to buy back the hospital medical center and, and provide some sustenance funding for that mm -hmm. in the future. I, I think that, again, if lawmakers are looking to put some one-time money towards something, they might look at the the investment in the U as one that will pay off of it because so many doctors are trained mm -hmm. at the U. And a lot of lawmakers realize that there's a shortage of primary care doctors around the state. They realize that they can't really go without a strong teaching. Brianna, when you look at the, the large number of bills mm -hmm. um, and, and agendas at the Capitol, does the university's budget uh, proposal look to you like it's going to be, you know, in the zone that gets funded, or is it struggling to get there? I, I mean, it's it's quite large. Um, it's a quite large request um, among many other large requests. Um, and I and I do think, you know, usually the university does get something um, for for some of the reasons Brian um, stated, and because they're they're the largest, uh, you know, public inst uh, public institution. But I I, I think that they they're competing with a lot of proposals that um you know may, might have more urgency for democrats you know i mean um as we've talked about democrats are really on the the other end of the age spectrum when they are thinking about their priorities they're thinking about children and families and early early education um and and child care and i do think that there some of those proposals are expensive and maybe getting more attention. I think we'll know a lot more tomorrow. Uh, the governor is due to lay out his budget revisions and uh, the U hospital acquisition was not in the first go round because it wasn't necessarily on the table. Then if he puts at least some marker down there, you'll, it'll give you a good clue that that top folks at the Capitol are thinking in that direction. Myron Franz used to be uh, the governor's 
budget um, director uh, is now at the university, um, one would assume that Myron has had a conversation with the governor, <laughs> um, just knowing the way in which um, uh, Myron um, is smart. Question from the audience, violent crime, carjackings, car thefts, all of them are up. What is the DFL legislature doing to keep the public safe? Brianna? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing actually a bill um, specifically around the catalytic converter thefts that is close to signing. Um, it's passed both the House it's and headed Senate. To the governor now. It's headed to the governor. Um, so that's one of the big ones. You know, the governor is still pushing his proposal um, to basically pump 300 million, um, or is it larger now? That's one area where he says he's going to bump it up in the proposal. Bump we'll it up in the proposal we see tomorrow um, to to go toward basically would send it to local governments and to the communities themselves to decide how they want to spend it. And that could be used to hire more officers, kind of whatever way in which they would like to. The the Democrats are moving a public safety proposal as well. Um, it's not as robust of a conversation as Brian said um, before, but I would imagine with the large surplus that we have, we do see some money maybe going toward, and, and this is one that Walls continues to push and talk about, um, do see some money going toward local communities to um, beef up their own response to crimes that you just listed. Yeah, and I'll have to check in on the carjacking legislation. Last year, there were proposals that went pretty far um, along in the process to create a special carjacking crime and ramp up the penalties there. Uh, it, it was one of the things that kind of hung up the final deal is the the level of uh, new punishment in the criminal justice realm that was uh, among the bills that helped unravel the broader deal. And so I don't know necessarily that Democrats are going to go as far as Republicans proposed last year, but they might do something just to show that they're aware that it's an issue and people are talking about it. We've had a, a, a number of questions from folks online uh, about the DFL living up to its agenda that it door knocked on and questions about is the DFL keeping Minnesota safe. Uh, here's a, um, a, a piece that Mark Johnson, the Republican leader in the Senate here in Minnesota, published um, just a few days ago in which he criticizes the DFL for allowing uh, minors to get abortions and sterilization without parental consent um, steps uh, in terms of the environment um, uh, that's going to raise the cost of electricity, uh, giving undocumented immigrants um, licenses or access to them, uh, allowing felons to now vote. Um, and the question I think that that um, that's put forward is, will there be a backlash? Or is the DFL going so far? Is this so extraordinary? what they're doing, that they're outstepping uh, where you see the state is, Brian? You know, early in session, Republicans were concerted in the branding push. They were going to label this session and the things coming out of it as extreme. And I don't know if any of you listen to Minnesota Public Radio, but I put together a mashup of all the times, or some of the times, I, I couldn't get them all in there because it would have taken hours, but uh, <laughs> where the word extreme was packaged in a sentence about this bill, that bill, that bill. And I, you know, the next election is still a ways away and it's going to be a presidential election. Mm -hmm. So that's going to drive everything. And I think the DFL right now is, is just figuring we're going to pass these bills and whatever repercussions come out of it, we'll deal with later that they feel like they got some mandate from voters to do things on abortion, some things on, on climate, some things on maybe even marijuana, yeah. which is, you know, again, going to be a dicier one. And I just feel like they they are not thinking necessarily about what the next election is going to hold in the same way that the party out of power is because they're trying to figure out a way to get back into power. Yeah, I would say the, the election we just had looms much larger over the conversation than the one that's coming up, which is, I think, a little bit different than um, four years ago or 10 years ago. I, I think that Democrats could kind of see a shift nationally 
um, that was favoring Republicans more, and, and they were very nervous about that. Um, Democrats, by all rights, shouldn't have done very well in this last election based on historical trends, um, but they did. And so, um, you know, I know some people are saying they have a narrow majority. How can they think that's a mandate? But they 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 could have done much much worse. Um, and and almost no one thought this trifecta scenario was even possible. So um, I get the sense that they're feeling, you know, that they're having these internal conversations, but they're feeling pretty confident about some of these agenda measures. And we also have to remember that the Democrats caucuses, while they do ha still have members from rural Minnesota, they're becoming more urban and suburban every cycle. Um, and there tends to be a just a little bit more unity on the agenda, um, even if, you know, it would have been, seemed like something a, a Democratic caucus 10 years ago wouldn't have been able to pass. And Larry, I remember us talking at the state fair before we went on Almanac about how the Senate was seemed like a, a real reach and they pulled an inside straight to get that majority. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, the Senate's there for four years. Yeah. And so some of these members, yeah, they might face tough votes this year. They might face tough votes next year, but they don't have to go back and defend those votes in an election setting for the house. There's a lot more mm -hmm. urgency. And so you're seeing them uh, sort of drive the conversation perhaps further then they'll ultimately get this session. I'm also curious about the reaction of the state to what's going on at the Capitol. And there's always a bit of a haze for much of the, um, po the voting population as to what's going on. At the Capitol. 13 bills have been passed. Some of them are significant, but a lot of the, the big action is still to come with the budget. Um, nonetheless, when I look over at Wisconsin, when Scott Walker won in 2010, he he took control of the governor's office from a Democrat. The Republicans seized the majority from Democrats in the legislature. They weren't large, you know, majorities, but they pushed through some pretty significant legislation that that significantly reduced the power of public unions for collective bargaining and other rights of unions and, and other steps. Um, and there was a tremendous backlash. You had you know, throngs of people in the Capitol protesting. You had national news coverage. There almost seems to be a yawn here in Minnesota. Apart from the Republican talking points, I'm looking for kind of the reaction. What what am I missing? What, what Where is the sense of outrage here in Minnesota among the conservative uh, Republicans? I mean, you might still be seeing an exhausted electorate yeah. that, you know, they've been through quite a bit in the last you know, four to six years where it's constantly been, politics has been in their living room, they might wanna check out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not used to the legislature actually doing, thing in, doing anything in January, February, yeah. March. They're used to the pile up in May and are they gonna get it done? Do they need to go into overtime? And boy, can't they do anything right over there? They might not be checked in as much to the, to the Capitol right now. Uh, the Republicans are trying to marshal opposition. And some of the conservative groups are holding a big rally or the, what they hope to be a big rally in early April mm -hmm. to remind people of what they say is a, a agenda going too far and stop the madness, I think is what they've labeled it. And uh, we'll see what kind of turnout they get. If they get a big turnout, maybe maybe there's something there. But as, as of now, we don't see or hear a lot. And there's not really much public polling to suggest that voters are fed up right now. And I, I also think we have seen some big protests at the Capitol. I mean, it, particularly around the PRO Act, which codified abortion rights. I mean, you did see the Capitol packed with people on both sides of that issue. Um, and it was very emotional. Um, and there are people who are, are going to be both very um, happy and very upset about our, about that law. Um, so I do think it's there. You know, I, I it's, it, we, we just, we see what the voters are thinking when the voters go out and vote. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, we're a little ways away from that. And, um, you know, and Republicans, are, I think, are still figuring out their strategy. They have talked about the extremes, but they do want to work with Democrats in some ways. Um, and and they don't know where voters are going to be at in the next fall campaign, who's going to be on the ticket for the for the, for the president and what is the convert national conversation going to be like um you know in over a year you just you don't really know very much um anymore that far ahead maybe a lightning round because we're running out of time um uh one uh one of our friends here says we haven't talked about 
climate, energy, or environmental legislation. Brian, could you give us an update? Is there a whole agenda on those things that's moving forward and likely to yeah, get Yeah, quite a bit. EV infrastructure. There's obviously the, the 24 EV in infrastructure refers to electric, electric vehicle, vehicles. Electric vehicles, they're probably going to do stuff on that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're talking a lot about resilience and making both government and residential properties more resilient to the to the extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think we'll see some stuff. It might not get the headlines. It might not get the coverage. I, we're, we're attempting to cover as much as we can, but there's a lot going on. Uh, but it's it's one of the, the the kind of the three pillars that that Democrats feel like they want on climate, abortion, and and concern about guns. And they did already and democracy. Sign, I, I guess yeah. four pillars. And they did sign the 2040 um, standard as well, which is a, a huge change that's already just been enacted into law. Uh, could you just say a quick word about the 2040 standard? Yeah, it it, it requires um, all energy from clean um, energy sources by 2040, which is faster, a decade faster than some of the larger utilities. They they had some of them had said they were able to get there, but it's it's quicker than um, the state had originally intended. Ambitious goal with uh, still some off ramps if they can't if they get need there. it. Yeah, uh, bonding uh, bonding is how we get money uh, for infrastructure. Uh, schools, waterworks, uh, roads, um, bridges, the, the full works. It hasn't happened for a couple of years because of the, the partisan bickering. Um, this year, the House voted. Uh, there was Republican support for it. It's now come over to the Senate, and it's come to a screeching halt with the Republican Senate leader saying it's dead on arrival because for it to pass, you need 60% support. And it sounds like the Republicans are not going to be providing that. Uh, Brianna, do you see a pathway forward here, or is this going to be year number three? This is the 2022 bill, as Democrats are describing it. It's a deal that fell apart last year, and they're saying if if this one doesn't work out, they they could also just move on to a new package of projects. I do think that they really want to do something on this this year. And there's been the um, go with you or without you. You too, with or without you. Without you yeah. um, uh, route proposed, which would mean Democrats could use cash um, because they've got a big surplus. They could just say, we're going to use cash in which we don't need Republican votes to help us pass. So This, this is another we'll know tomorrow thing because yeah. the bonding bill that passed, the, the it's a, actually a pair of bills, one cash, one borrowing, is they're both on the docket for Senate consideration tomorrow. They need seven Republicans to come over. We don't know if there are some of them there. Some have been involved in the negotiations and we saw in the house 21 republicans came over which was 10 more than needed and so mm -hmm. there might that might be some indication that republicans feel like this might be our only chance to get the projects we want and if they go a solo route they might cut out our projects mm -hmm. um uh, final question um for folks who are following politics it's pretty ugly particularly if you watch washington and you look at youtube or just follow uh, news stories. There's a lot of yelling and name calling and just flat out rudeness. Um, in Minnesota, and I'm gonna try out a proposition here. I'd be curious what you two think. For the most part, uh, members of both parties talk to each other, they're, they're collegial. We had um, you know, very sad news with Senator uh, Dietzik uh, having cancer surgery uh, earlier this week. There were a lot of members in both parties who were providing support to her and, you know, uh, encouraging her. Is it different in Minnesota? Is there something to the Minnesota Knights or should we just give that up? I think Minnesota Nice does extend to politics. I think I think it's also just a different, uh, you know, you certainly have um, folks who are sort of the more firebrands in, in each party, um, but you have more people somewhere, uh, you know, in the middle of that who um, really want to work together to pass things on, on both sides. And and I just, I think sometimes <laughs> you hear in committee, things get heated and, and then, you know, people back down and then they feel bad about it later. And, um, you know, it's very Minnesotan, the sort of of Ashok's like um, mentality translates to politics. And we don't see the kind, I, I don't see, we do see outbursts, but I don't see every day the kind of um, division that really cripples Washington from doing anything. And, and I think the incentive structure might be slightly different here mm -hmm. uh, where it seems like this year in particular, the, the legislators that are doing stuff and getting things done, they're the ones who are getting a lot of the spotlight where perhaps, in, you know, Washington is the ones who are maybe the loudest or mm -hmm. say the most outrageous things. And uh, may, maybe that 
has something to do with it. I, I, I personally try to keep my eye on the ball as much as I can and, and not get distracted by a, a wayward comment or something that uh, builds attention for somebody who only wants attention. Right. And so thank you yeah. very much to both of you. This has been a terrific panel. If you want to know what's going on in Minnesota politics, sense of capital, this is where it was at. Um, also want to just let you know, we've got some great programs coming up. Senator Jeff Markley from uh, Oregon will be here talking about uh, his talking um, filibuster reform and other issues. That'll be Friday, March 24th at uh, noon. Um, we also have a program coming up April 19th on election audits. It's being um, um, the lead presenter there is uh, Jennifer Morell, who's one of the top people in the country on election audits as part of our pioneering program in election administration. Then coming up April 25th, we've got a fascinating program called Pushing Against Jim Crow, uh, the amazing worlds of African-American fraternal organizations. And it's being presented by Theda Scotchpole, who's a renowned professor from Harvard and is based on her decades of research looking at uh, voluntary associations. Thank you for joining us here, folks here and online. Um, this program will be posted both on YouTube and as a podcast um, in a day or two, so you can look out for that. And finally, I want to just uh, give a shout out uh, to those of you who might be interested in supporting this program and other programs. We rely on that to uh, keep this uh, sort of um, terrific conversations going. Once again, Brianna Bierschbach, Brian Bax, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.